What's up, everybody? It's In Light in the Shadows. Today is episode 32 with Matt O'Connor from Fathers for Justice. And I'm absolutely gassed for this one, guys. I- I've been off for about four weeks or so now. Um, I'm just going through a weird transition in my life. Some of you may be aware I'm on a fertility journey uh, last four years and just saying it real on camera for you guys. Um, I've got a big surgery coming up next few weeks. Um, it- it- it's made me feel all sorts of feelings, fellas. Like, I've been like, one day I'm like dead anxious, one day I'm like excited. Um, and so I'm just having to like unpack that in my life really. And I realized guys as well, I've done like five full months of enlightened episodes without taking a break. And I was like, right, right, I am due a rest. So I just want to say to you, thank you for hanging in with us. Um, we keep growing slowly but surely, but I- I'm still with you. We're supporting men round the clock on our, fi- on our private men's Facebook group. So check it out. Just come up on the screen right now. Um, it's safeguard, we've got rules, and there's some just fireworks co- just popping off on there. We encourage each other so much, but without further ado, today we've got Matt O'Connor, as I said. And some of you would know of Matt, you might have seen his mugshot, you might have seen his class hairstyle and his quirky specs. I don't, I don't know, but he's, his passion is absolute fire to support men and particularly fathers. And we just thought no better way to kick off father's day for 2021 and have him on so matt thank you mate uh for making time for us oh uh, brother rory you're doing great work mate and and uh you know it's uh it's great to see um you know you take control of your life dealing with the issues talking about it discussing it um because we are we're not great at talking about issues sometimes mm-hmm. and, and that's part of the that's part of the issue they say it's a man's world and i can tell you uh, all the empirical data and the facts say it most definitely is not a man's world and we need to be talking about it in podcasts, in public. Most importantly, we need to be talking about it in our parliament, um, which doesn't happen. So Yeah, well, that's why I've got to keep on speaking, keep on fighting and um, just hoping that t- our and you, chat today and, does that. And you look good in a Batman outfit. I've got to say, you're, 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 <laughs> you're in better shape than me, brother, because I look more like the Michelin man than Superman. <laughs> So, uh, so team, well, I think we need younger, good-looking people like you, rather than fat old bastards like me. <laughs> That's what we need, Corey. We need um, a, a new generation of superhero. You yeah, are why not? Wait, well, looking, brother. we've got each other's contact details, so <laughs> I'll, hey, you call the... the uh, I'll send my tailor out. out. We'll get you measured up. Yeah, give you a ladder. You'll be fine. Oh, shoot. Matt, I've, I've, I'm really curious. I've, I've been following you guys for a few years now, so I, I really have. Um, just due to my childhood, I've had um, father issues. I, like, I love my dad. I honour him even on camera. Uh, but there were some um, of course. some some moments in my life where you know he left, he had mm. his reasons, and um, he was absent in my life. So um, I've been passionate about trying to unpack why fathers um, become absent um, at every family is unique of course but I just want to ask you like why did you and how did you set up Fathers for Justice in the first place because there'll be some people like watching and they might recognize you slightly but like what took you on the journey to like inspire and help men the way you do well I love to say you love the way you'd say you might recognize me like you may have seen this man on crime watch yeah that's what that's what normally that's what normally is it but no the journey look I mean you know it's as soon as you said about your father wasn't but my, my dad wasn't um around much um and he but he came from the west of ireland the west of ireland was like men were separated from the women men went to the pub women stayed at home women looked after the kids uh and and uh, and so he wasn't really around a great deal and um that was kind of that that kind of stayed with me a bit actually and i, I just thought you know that when i was um when I was going through my, what I call the uh, 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 the mid nineties, what I call my wonder years, cause I wonder what the fuck happened to them. Cause I was rocking and rolling and I was designing bars and restaurants and, and, and not, you know, I was, I was, yeah, I thought I was a pretty good dad actually. I was a pretty shit husband. Uh, I don't think I was a great husband by any figment of the imagination, but you, 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 you kind of, I kind of went on this journey where I was, you know, uh, sort of probably hovering around the Mick Jagger mark at one point. And it's hard to believe looking at me, but it was it was a little colourful. If you've ever seen The Wolf of Wall Street, my life was like the Poundland version of that. So it was it was it was it was pretty it was pretty rock and roll. 
and uh, no exaggeration. Um, and and so then all of a sudden, I got to a point where my wife asked for divorce, and um, and then some fucker switched the lights off. It was like you know everything changed, and, and then I realised, yeah, we end, ended up getting divorced and going to court. And then I wasn't seeing my kids. So I was like, what the fuck's happened? What's going, what's going on here? And so I ended up leaving the house, big mistake, never leave the house. Um, ended up leaving the house and ended up living in a company flat in London, which marks probably the most difficult, one of the most difficult periods of my life where I was living on my own. I was going through the family courts. Uh, then my business partner was killed. Um, the group of companies uh, went under. I was left with sort of like 15 quid in my pocket at one point. I remember that. And having to having to relocate pretty fucking quickly to yeah, find somewhere to live. So I eventually moved to Suffolk, a little village called Cavendish there. Um, so it was an like, emergency takeoff and what should have been a crash landing somehow. Thanks be to God. I'm not a particularly religious person, but I do. I'm a little bit spiritual. I thought, thank God, somebody somewhere. Um, has put, you know, um, put their arms around me and given me a, um, a, a lucky break. And there was a mate of mine, uh, Will Mins, who 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 bailed me out. He he he, he said, I've got a spare camper van. So this fucking thing was like, like you know, the roof was tied on with like, you know, it's got one of those elevated roofs that goes up. Yeah, yeah, there. I know which one you mean. It was tied oh, on soft with, top, with okay. those bike, one of those stretchy biker couple of things you put on bikes. And um, so the roof wasn't on properly. Um, and but it was it was like fire with like yeah, it's wheels, and he gave me some money, and um, I went and um, <laughs> I went to the I went to the unexpurgated version of the story because it, it, it it's long and it's 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 a little bit rude, um, but the upshot of it was I, I sort of relocated, but ended up in in the family courts, the devil's labyrinth of the family courts, and. Mm could not believe that I had no rights in law to see my children. Couldn't get mad around it. Couldn't get around the way I was treated. Um, and it was the most painful experience of my life. And, and it, it, it nearly killed me several times over. Make no bones about that. Um, and uh, I remember starting to drink really, really heavily. I mean, really, really heavily. Um, cause I like my drink, but yeah, yeah. When, when I like when I was happy, it's great. Love it. But when I was down, it became, yeah, I was self-medicating. Yeah, so just, yeah. um, just to become numb and it's dangerous cause alcohol is everywhere. You know, it's just like everywhere you look, it's fucking booze. And if you're in that state, in that mental state, and it is only a symptom, the alcohol, drinking alcohol is only a symptom of your, of your mental health condition, your medical condition. And some of us are going to be. Some of us are going to be addicted to drugs. Some of us are not going to be addicted to anything. Yeah. Some of us, I've got a bit of an addictive personality, which is when I do something, I've said, you do it, overdo it. it. all out, yeah. I'm yeah, like, I always I'm like do, overdo everything. They will tell you, my friends, are, I will overdo anything. So um, so I just ended up in in in, in this position. I remember, a, and, and it's still, the sh I, was, I was in East London, Shoreditch. I was living in Shoreditch, which wasn't trendy then. As soon as I left, it became trendy. I don't know why. <laughs> something to do with something to do with like fuck, he's left. Um, but the 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 off license is still there. I went past it the other day. I was in I was in East London. And the off license is still there. I thought, fuck me. And that's where I used to go get my boots. And I remember just walking uh, through London with a couple of bottles of Sir Jack of Daniels, who was my then spiritual advisor. I used to love yeah. Oh, oh yeah, I love Jack. bourbon. Yes. Oh man, yeah. it was it was uh, it was good gear, and I remember just what, well, and I was absolutely, I was fucked. I was in a terrible state. Yeah. Been in the family court. They they that day, and they I remember them telling me, you know, you can't go back into your house. You've got to provide a list of what your property is in the house. I said, what the fuck are you talking about? I said, this is my house, my property. I don't remember everything I've got in the house. It's like a fucking generation game. Cuddly toy, toaster, fridge freezer. What? Just what? And there was an Irish barrister. And I'm my family of the West of Ireland. And um, there was an Irish barrister in there. And as I walked out, 
I'm, 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 I just thought, I'm going to have to wish you well in forging a very close relationship with an oncoming London bus. And as I went in, he was in the side room. I thought, you cunt. I just, I cannot believe anybody would do this to anybody else. So unfortunately, I slipped up on a bit of loose carpet, Rory, sort of fell into him and my fist accidentally connected with his head and he went sliding off the other end of the table. Um, luckily, I was in a suit. So I managed to get out of the building because they thought I was a fucking barrister. Um, and that night is when I just, I just, I cannot keep putting myself through this on this yes. hamster wheel of fucking misery. I put your face into a piranha bowl every morning. I just ended up on Waterloo Bridge and, and, and I just, I'd done, I used to do lists. I had it on my iPhone, but I used to do lists. And I just did lists of reasons. I remember sitting on the bench on, on, on South Bank just with a list of reasons not to carry on. Let me tell you, wow. the list, I had to unfold the A4 papers. So it went on quite a while. And the only reasons to carry on were my two children. And uh, so it was, it was, you know, I was like thinking, well, you know, do you, you know, I thought if I go into the Thames, they're not going to get me out unless they've got a Japanese whaling vessel that's going to harpoon my arse, you know. Um, so I just thought, you know, um, instead of, instead of jumping off bridges when we start climbing them and, 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 and that's kind of where the genesis, oh, yes. of, that's where the genesis of F and J sort of came about. And then following that, I think there was an interesting conversation with Bob Geldof at some point who rang up for me. They, I, I was just on, on the throes of starting this. Well, I was going to go up and do a bar restaurant because I got back on my feet pretty quickly. Thankfully, I had some good clients. I worked for some big FMCG um, clients in sort of food marketing and stuff. So I was in, you know, I was doing marketing and PR and design stuff. And uh, the, <laughs> I was thinking about starting this campaign. I went through various alliterations of what this could have been. Yeah, coming up with a name. You know, do we call it Parents of Parity? That's bollocks, you know, easy fucking rubbish. Um, I wanted to do what it said in the tin. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, to, to do what it said in the tin. But I was also thinking about doing a restaurant and I was like thinking, oh, I'm going to want to do something that's funny and happy and I'm going to enjoy myself. And and uh, and I had, I used to design bars and restaurants as well. And, and, and I had a great Algerian chef and his girlfriend and, we were lined up to do something in, in Essex. But in the end, my heart said to me, this is this is your cause. Mm. You, this is, if there's a sense of you, you should do something. Because I used to be, as a, as a kid, when I was a teenager, I was, I was in Amnesty International. I was, I was, I was in the anti-apartheid movement. So I had a history of, 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 of I was on Miners Picket Lines in nine, 1984, skiving yeah. off school, skiving off school. Um, getting Justice busted. warrior, mate. Can't get enough yeah, of but I, yeah, but I, but I hung up. I hung up yeah. my cape, you know. I hung up my cape and 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 was just enjoying or trying to enjoy life, and probably enjoying it a bit too much. And but then to be plunged back into that, it certainly seemed to be a kind of sense of, I'd say destiny, but it kind of just felt that this is what I should do, yeah, inside of me. And so. <laughs> Bob Geldof was trying to hold me. And I used to have a girl, Jenny, who I'm still very good friends with. She's Australian Jenny. Fucking eight kids, fucking eight kids. And um, the irony was she was ended up working with me on this. And um, she, said, she said, oh, yeah, this Irish bloke rang up. She said, oh, fucking spirit of fucking Matt, fucking O'Connor like this. And she says, well, you, you can't speak to him. He's busy, he's busy, you know, because they sort of sense all the calls and screen stuff. And, and he's like, uh, he says, yeah. I said, oh, well, I'll fucking speak to him now. He says, well, I'm sorry, you won't speak. You know, you know, he left the email in. He says, tell him it's Bob fucking Goldoff. Like, it sounds like a, she comes in, I'm on the other phone. He's going, you have to get off the phone. It's Bob Geldof. I said, Bob who? Bob Geldof. But, and that's how, that's how that kind of conversation started. And he very kindly uh, complimented me and flattered me and mm. said, we need somebody who's fucking stupid with a big gob to... <laughs> Try oh, it's class. Shake it up a bit, and he, he, he said, "Keep it funny." So, but I, I'd already at that point knew we kind of had a, a rough game plan of sort of going about. I did, the first thing we did was, was just literally to get attention, because you know, unless people Absolutely. have heard about the issue or heard of us, how can you find us? So that's the sort of genesis. Amazing. 
but at, but at that time, my kids ended up, because I threatened to walk away, my last court hearing, I said to the judge, I climbed up on the bench in the court, and I climbed up and I said to the judge, I'm done. I said, I'm done. I said, it was the last fucking thing I do on God's earth. I'm going to put you out of a fucking job. And next time with that, there'll be 100 people behind me. And I walked out of the court. I remember Maggie Derrick, it was, it was a cap officer that came on and asked me, you can't walk away, Matt? You can't. I said, no, no more. No more. Um, two weeks later, the kids were up staying with me. You know, that's how it flipped. Simply because my ex-wife was using the system to punish me. You know, that's where it came. Mm. Some some women use the system to uh, remove the father entirely. Which happened with David Blunkett, the former Home Secretary. You know, you're an inconvenience. They've got a new partner. They want to move on with their lives. They don't want you to do, do with you. Some women just want to do it to punish you. What's the way of hurting somebody who may have hurt, hurt them, you know, yeah. and stop them seeing the people that they love the most? Um, so I was blessed. It turned around um, literally overnight. And, you know, mercifully, 20 years later, you know, this Saturday, I've got all the boys down. This got, you know, the boys, and we're going up. We've got a restaurant by a river here. And uh, yeah, we're going to sink a few drinks and it's quality. have a laugh. And so if there's a message out of that story, and I say to everybody, is, you know, like Churchill said, if you're going through hell, just keep going because the tunnel does, will come to an end. It doesn't always, not in every case, you know, do you, um, is it a successful end? Um, but in many cases, actually, it is a successful ending. Um, it's just a question of how you navigate your way through this devil's labyrinth um, and, be, mate. and be smart because you've got to think, when, you, when you're dealing with family law, you never deal with a more emotional subject than children. And you mustn't let your heart over your head. You mustn't. You know. Oh, that's some good advice. And we're going we're gonna to come to that because I, I know there's some fathers that be watching this that experience, sadly, mm. uh, similar behaviours, similar circumstances yeah. um, w- with their ex-partners. Um, but w- what I just want to unpack quickly there and out loud in my head f- to re- you know remind the viewers is, there's two things that stood out for me in that was one, your mate will, you had like, you had someone there, but they didn't, they didn't, they didn't just give you like small talk and they go, Oh, come on, mate. You know, you know, I'm here for you. Call me. He just showed up and he showed it with his actions. Like he didn't just give you like false promises or, and I just, I just want to stress that for, for people who are watching, like, how important it is to, to your your inner circle or people that you know you can rely on because it's in those dark times where you you, you do like I can relate not to the, the, the father issue but when I, I feel utter devastation in the past like it just crushes him and then what it starts to do is tell you lies like that you are and then you kind of like isolate yourself and hide away and then you feel oh, no one's here for me and you you start thinking all sorts of things but yeah I just I love how will like just showed up and and then he didn't just show up he went above and beyond and 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 really just provided something for you and i just thought that's that's beautiful and that's only that no because i didn't expect it? i didn't expect any help from anybody i just yeah. didn't any help so he showed up he it was an incredible act of kindness incredible act of generosity and i was pleased that i i paid him back with significant interest because i got back on my feet very, i was lucky to get back because so I had my own sort of branding agency. I was working as a freelancer. And I was in a good position, really, to, you know, if I could just get through the whole thing and survive in one piece, then, I, uh, you know, I was in I was in a very very fortunate position to to recover. But you're right, well, isn't it? you know. Um, but it's very rare to get people like that. Very, yeah, very, yeah. very rare. Very rare. Yeah, because you know? some people haven't got like camper vans. But I just I just love that. I think that's like what that's what brotherhood is all about. Like, it's, it's quite funny with the camper well, van. They did the key. <laughs> My ex-wife, God bless her. She, she, she was. Oh, because we lived on a. I'd moved to this. It used to belong to. It's called Kim Sings in Cavendish. It used to belong to the Chief Justice of England and Wales around the time of the Peasants' Revolt, and the peasants came and took him from there and chopped his head off and put it on a pole, in, just like the road in Bury St Edmunds. I mean, I love the old house in days there. I really do. 
that's what should happen to a lot of judges. Uh, obviously, I'm just joking about that. And and um, but I remember when Kafka's came up to look at the house, the my landlord, who was a super super guy, Tony Tony Pauls, he's no longer with us. He's a great guy. Yeah, you know, there was a there was a fucking pheasant shoot going on out the back, and it's actually came out this pheasant dropped like a stone, a wing stone into the garden. I thought, oh my god, you just imagine that, you know, the ex is going to go live ammunition, live ammunition, uh, and and then the thing with the camper van was she was worried about the seat belts. I think fuck the seat belts, the roof's not even on properly, you know, <laughs> like. The kids are sitting in the back of the car there. Oh, the it was a bit breezy in here. I said, that's just the air conditioning. You know, own, like, as the roof kept going up and down as we we're driving along. Those, God bless them. God bless them. The, cheap, the cheap air conditioning. Yeah, uh, the cheap air conditioning. Oh, Unfortunately, oh, the camper van saga ended. When I came back, I was living near Sudbury in Suffolk. I came back one night and the roof had been peeled off. It just come off in the wind. And uh, so it was then the, the new version of the camper van, the camper van cabriolet. I remember driving back in the rain, Jenny, my sister, it's like, it was, it was, but so, yeah, and this is what you're going to do. Yeah. If you go, you've got to find the humor. Mm -hmm. This is what I tried to do was yeah. sugarcoat the pain. Cause it's so fucking miserable mm. and so difficult to get through. And my only way of dealing with it was a one. I wanted to take, I wanted to fight the government. I wanted to fight the courts. I wanted to fight everybody. Plus. Um, but also I wanted to take the fucking piss because you <laughs> are taking the piss out of me. Yeah, I love so it. I've got no rights as a father in this country. Fuck you. Fuck you, basically. And the idea was to make them look like fucking idiots, which they are, in my view. And um, and so that's why we were trying to do, you know, we, we tried to do in the spirit of Monty Python and satirical protest was to do yeah. these to do these things where we had overweight guys in Lycron <clears throat> on national landmarks and and, and that to me was taken the and i know because i was hauled into scotland yard many 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 times um yeah it really upset them because it made them look stupid it's quality mate and that's that's like a typical classic bloke of making like a situation with banter um it, it's one of our tools i think we can access and i i, I love i love it's great yeah, exactly. I, I, what I do yeah. love as well is what you did. You drew the line in the sand as well, sitting on the on the bench near the river. And you said something really powerful for our viewers, I think, to pick up. You said, um, I don't want to jump off bridges. I, I want to climb them. And I just want, I want to ask you this. Like, do you know when you came to that moment, mate, where you feel like it, it's like, I, I had this, I call it the crossroads, a, a path of destruction or life. Like, you go yeah. to destruction or life. Like, I know it might be tricky for you to answer, but can you think of like, obviously you wrote your list and I know that I recall that, but what, I don't know, what is that thing that happens to you in that moment where you decide to yourself, you have that perspective, you choose it, you choose life and you go, you've got, you know, I've got to fight. What, what is it? I don't, this is something that I'm trying to like unpack. It's an now. epiphany. It's a religious experience in my view. It's an epiphany. Oh. It's the dawning of, of the dawning of something. It's not, it's not, it, it's a it's a it's a light switch moment, but it's it's it's, it's more difficult than that because then you've got that action. It. You can say I'm going to do this, but you've got action. It that is hard. Mm. That is you know when I, when when you know you've got to look at it and go right. How okay if I'm going to start what am I climbing? What am I doing? What's it called? So straight away you're thinking about you know the the name of the thing and what what's the image? What's the theme? What, how do we go about raising awareness? How do we go about shouting to the world? You know, sharing our stories, trying to share our pain because the family court's a secret. How do we, how do we rattle the cages? And I just went, right, let's go after the fucking queen. Let's go after the church and let's go after the politicians and the three key pillars of the establishment. And um, that, that was my, and I, you know, it, 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 it was, it was something that um, I thought was, um, you know, but, but it's, it's not easy because you can see you've got to find a way of action in that and then committing huge, huge energy because I was doing F or J and running, you know, the marketing side of a 50 million pound business wow. in ice cream. So I used to do a lot of rock and roll ice cream and my own ice cream brand. I was doing all that alongside F or J. So I, I work 
stupid hours sometimes, you know, I'm up at five most mornings, I'll finish at seven, eight most nights. Last year during the pandemic, we we're trying to get advice out of people. We we're doing that like seven days a week, absolutely dead. And mm. but my in my head, I was like going, I want 18 months. I want to be on the front cover of every newspaper. I want the front cover of Time magazine, do a book, blah, blah, blah. And you know, we we did it. Did it's it. Class, mate. Um, but it, it requires a superhuman effort and a lot of help from other people and other dads who also contributed significant amounts. Um, you know, um, one of them recently passed, which is quite, uh, it's been quite upset, a guy called uh, Ron Davis, um, who, 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 in fact, Ron Davis, as, as, as a good friend of ours, Gary Birch, said to me the other day, uh, Ron Davis was father's justice in that he was a guy who'd been crushed, destroyed by the system that denied access to his children, then pursued re relentlessly, mercilessly by the child maintenance service. Um, you know, and he was never, tragically never reunited with his children. And he, he passed away um, about, about, about a week ago. But Ron's life was utterly destroyed by the system. Um, and he went for, I remember, and this is in terms of like mental health, um, one of the worst nights of my life and, and you know was sitting in his kind of bungalow in Worthing and but it was all just full of his life stuff and bits he was selling and his bedroom was like I think it was a double bed but it was floor to ceiling full of just shit his life stuff yeah. just bits of he taken out of the house and there was just room for him on the on the on the bed and I remember I was sitting on a chair but like shrapped by yeah, like, like nothing yeah. <laughs> you couldn't swing a fucking rat alone a cat in this room i remember sitting there and we we're drinking whiskey i was going this is this is terrible nobody should be left in this position you know where your life is just and it is literally destroyed you know that these dads who go for it um often leave the homes mistakenly unfortunately sometimes by force but mistaken um and then they you, you end up in a bed scene surrounded by booze drugs suicidal on your own there's no help there's very little help out there's people like you doing what you're doing but if you can see a doctor i mean i went to counselors i ended up in rehab all sorts of fucking places but there's very 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 little help for you out there mm -hmm. um if you're a man, which is why we got, was it 15 men a day, 5,000 men a year, take their lives in this suicide epidemic. And the government doesn't give a damn. Doesn't give a damn about men. Doesn't give a damn about dads. Does very little. We have a minister for women. There's no minister for men. There's nobody Seen coordinating. That. That's There's nobody coordinating a response at government level to the men's health crisis. Um, yeah, it's, it's an appalling state of affairs. And Ron Davis, is the epitome of that. He's a victim, mm -hmm. a victim of a cruel and degrading system of so-called family justice. And um, I'm hoping we'll give him the send off that he deserves mm -hmm. um, because he was a great, he was a great guy. He was a, he was a big guy, fun guy, but uh, a loving, caring dad who, 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 who just unfortunately ended up on the receiving end of this appalling system. But, you know, there were those cases, but then we have success stories. Like we've had, you know, a couple of shared parenting wins in the last week and where we're fighting within the system. We've almost become like, um, we start off as a campaign group and we've now, I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, viruses have become very fashionable. So we, 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 we thought we remodeled ourselves on. So we've, we've become more like a, a virus inside the system now. So we're providing help and support. We started that a few years ago, but we never did it. We were a campaign group. Yeah. It, it took me, I'll tell you, I was, I was just saying this to somebody last night. It took me about, I think about 16, 17 years before we could offer help. Yeah. Because I couldn't deal with it. No, no, it, 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 it's a lot, I mate. Like being it. like an advocacy, it's, it's, it's a lot of time, a lot of love, a lot of energy it's a resource it's like one of the greatest resources but like i know you i know you like from picking up from your vibe 
Matt. Like, if you're going to do something, you got to do it properly. And Agreed. you know, when, when, when you're dealing with lives. This is what I say to my missus. Like, I don't, I don't brag. I don't tell anyone what we do. But mm. I've got DMs on the daily, just keeping men alive. Mm. And then we've got, we've got, we've got people going into the NHS at A and E, checking in, doing the right things. They want to take their life, and they get told after three hours, put your mask on. They get told, oh, you're not really suicidal because you don't look like you would have done it by now. You know, oh, no. This is the kind no. of thing we're dealing with. And you're like, like I'm trying to, like yourself, I'm trying to like transition, you know, that uh, to create like a service because we, we just give a crap. And it, it's, it's, it's really tricky because you're like, you want to give it all, but like, when do you make the jump? You know, you've also got to fund it. You've got to fund it. People forget this, this, this costs money. Everything costs money. And there's no money. The, the women's health industry and the women's domestic advanced lobby is massively funded by our money, by taxpayers' money. Yeah. Millions and millions of pounds poured into it. There's nothing for men. We did a, a thing, I think it was last year, before last one, looking at um, domestic abuse shelters for men. There's like none. There's no money for domestic abuse. Uh, male domestic abuse victims, which are one in three victims. There's nothing. It's like We nothing. brought it up. We, we attended a, re a really good uh, service called Equation. Really good. Yeah. Not, not publicly shaming them. So me, me and my uh, mate, Steve, who did um, episode, I think, 23, he's, he's a victim of um, domestic violence. Right. Um, recovered, got up, but he wanted to take his own life. And he, he and I sat in the training and we sat there and we're like, right. As it was going on, it was good. But we were just thinking out loud, where's the support for men? And, yeah. and we did. We asked the question and we said, right, when you have a, a, a male come to your service of crisis point, you know, where, like what you've described with women, they, they get that support, they have a, like housing. And, and we asked them like in Nottinghamshire, what, what's there for men? They're like, well, we don't really have it at the minute. And I was like, and I looked at the stats and mm. this is just reported victims because they, you know, like you and I know as a man, as a man, yeah. you ain't going to like to admit, oh, yeah. I, I'm a, yeah. a victim of domestic violence. It's over 780,000 men a year. Mm. And yeah. That's what we know of. And you go, and there's nothing. And you just go, oh, my freaking God. But if you think the British crime survey, the last British crime survey for England and Wales, um, I think it was 2019, you know, it's one in three victims of domestic abuse are men. And then you think, if that's massively underreported because of the stigma, I've got a very close male member of my family who was assaulted by his girlfriend. And really bad, you know, really aggressive, laptop smashed. Would he report it to the police? No. And yet she'll threaten him. And all of us who don't report stuff to the police are not only doing ourselves a disservice, but they're, they're doing other men a disservice because there is a duty to report uh, stuff like that. Um, and also, not only if you end up in a family court at some point, you're going to need third party corroboration. You're going to need a crime reference stamp or something to prove if there's been any domestic abuse. I mean, the mother can say anything and the court will take it at face value. But if you're the man, you will need some kind of third party um, corroboration. So everywhere you look, if you're a man, and I and people say, well, why the fuck are you still doing this? I'm still fucking doing this because I've got a father of three boys. You know? Come on. It's... Just, it's um... Brings fire in my belly, man. I'm, lo I'm loving. I'm loving talking to you today. It's it just it fires me up and it inspires me to care. keep going. Yeah, you can. I can. Definitely. You know, but I don't want my children to go through what I'm in for. I really don't. It's got to be the crappiest thing. I can't even imagine. Like, I'm an uncle, and oh my gosh, I'm yeah. like I feel like a dad to them almost. <laughs> Not in a weird toxic way. Yeah. Sort of way, but like. You know, they're just everything to me because I haven't got my own kids. I've described to you like four years waiting. I can't, I can't, I can't imagine it. Um, and even the short life that our our boy Malachi had, you know, when we, when we miscarried, it was just like I couldn't imagine. Like it, it's the pain that I'd experienced, but then it's the pain that they experienced because I've experienced as a child. Like you're just in the middle, and yeah, but it's it, it's you you gotta you gotta. You know, if you're not going to fight for your fucking kids, then what the hell are you going to fight for? You know, we fight wars, phony wars in foreign countries, right? Yeah. For people, leaders who don't give a shit about you, soldiers who return. As many as many men die when they return from suicide as die on the battlefield. 
and they're just dumped. You know, I've got, you know, case after case where soldiers come back, they fought for their country, they put their lives on their line for the country, yeah. and they're treated like scum, yeah. treated like shit, dumped in terrible accommodation, left to hang, no rights in law to see the, you know, you know, to see exactly. their children. Have you seen this geezer? I've not like seen it, no, no. Sar Sergeant Craig Harrison, he's got the world's right. longest um, sniper shot. I won't I won't spoil it for you, but I I, I reckon it's a freaking unreal book. I'll have a look at it. And and it just yeah, I, yeah, I won't spoil it, but it's related to exactly yeah, what yeah. you're saying. You just think good but it just makes your blood boil because everything you hear at the moment is toxic masculinity. But there's nothing toxic about masculinity. What we're in the middle of is 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 a new age. Uh and and the new church is is the high church in my view. Of feminism, of liberalism, uh, and, and and you know the Me Too movement, or as I call it, the Me 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 and Me Too movement, um, which is demonising men, which is demonising boys, children, our children. They say, oh, there's rape culture or sexual abuse culture in school. And again, well, hang on a minute. Who the fuck has been raising boys? Mostly women. You know, three million kids live in a fatherless home. So it's mostly women. Mm -hmm. Who the fuck has been teaching our kids? Mostly women. Who the fuck has been raping kids in schools, underage boys? Mostly women. Let's not pin all the blame on men simply because of our gender, simply because you know, we've got a meat and two veg downstairs. That's how you're discriminating against me. You're discriminating against me on the basis of my gender. That's as bad as discriminating against somebody on the basis of the colour of their skin. It's unacceptable. And yet we live in this age, you know, the, the, the tyranny of what Dr. Johnson called the prevailing orthodoxy. You know, we all have to think in this way. And we need men and women to stand up and say, look, you know, our sons are not sexual abusers. Our sons are not rapists. Our sons are not violent abusers. You know, we've got to take responsibility as women because we've largely, by nature of the fact that dads, many dads have got child access issues in this country and many dad children are growing up in father's home, that, that they've got to share the burden of responsibility for what's happening to our children. But think about the legacy. Now, my son, my, my, my youngest son, I've got to say, uh, Archie's 15, he's six foot three. Good. Hello, dad. <laughs> Rebel like down there. Um, you probably imagine he's not the most PC of children, you know, but he, he, he was in there and there was a thing on school the other day and I was showing him about consent. And it was like a male figure giving a female figure, like, like a line drawing video of, of, of saying, right, if you offer somebody a cup of tea, you don't force on them, you know, and you, you ask them if they say no, and I, I was reminded of him, he's watched Father Ted of Mrs. Doyle, but you like a cup of tea, Father? And, and I was just like, going, this is just, it's so patronised, so ridiculous. Everybody knows the difference between right and wrong. Most people know the difference between right and wrong. Most children know the difference between right and wrong. So it goes back to what you said, though, Matt. It's about the shared responsibility of nurturing the child. So it's like that most people aren't going to, if they've got like, you know, parents who are, who are given the right to be around. Do you know what I mean? It's they need. A lot of these mums, you know, we, you know, we've had a million inquiries in 20 years, right? And a lot of these mums just dump the kids in the rooms, right? They've got no contact with their dads, right? There's no, there's no boundary set. They're just dumped in the bedrooms. Or on the street. Or, yeah, or sleep. But a lot, a lot are watching porn, yeah, yeah. And, and stuff like this. And... You know, you're thinking, well, this is this is where we are, you know, utterly irresponsible as a society. Uh, we have learned nothing. We have children in need once a year and we pretend it's lip service to looking after kids. You know, but our attitude is Dickensian to children. It's still Dickensian. It's still deeply irresponsible. You know, that we fail to protect the right of a child to both their parents, which is enshrined. Uh, in the uh, human rights legislation, the UN Convention on Rights of the Child. We ignore all that and we do it. All the MPs are fully aware of this issue. 
But no, we can't have parental equality. We can't make sure children get the best of both their parents because of this absolutely perverted perversion of the course of natural justice and this ideology, which is so, you know, in my mind, evil, you know, and, and, and it's harming children, it's literally. Yes. So we're not only destroying lives at one end, we're also, you know, you know, you know destroying and leaving a dangerous and harmful toxic legacy in the minds of boys who have been told they're shit. Boys have been told they're rapists. Boys have been told they're abusers. Don't. I said to Archie and my son, I said, you know, if we get any shit from the school, I'll pull, I'll pull them out of the fucking school. If they start going too far in that particular direction yeah. and saying, saying that, you know, you know, that he's, he's a rapist or he's an abuser or you mustn't do this to girls and all this kind of nonsense, you know, it's just not acceptable. We've got to treat men and women equally Absolutely that's right. so love that oh man right, i'm off the soapbox I no got... no it's class i love it i love the passion don't don't apologize for this and 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 you tailor it in your little I, i'm i'm getting your banter and your sense of humor already like slipping those little comments in as well so i'm loving it um i was gonna ask you to you know we've got a, a couple of things you know what i love about this it's flowed so like chilled i i've not had to ask the questions that i had in my mind prepped um, but I did want to ask you about, yeah. you know, being a father, because there'll be people watching this who are, you know, aspiring fathers um, <coughs> or, or currently fathers. Um, I just want to think, like, what's the best kind of advice you've got that a father can, like, develop in himself to better his life and his family's life? What, what could, what's the best thing that you've learned to, to develop within yourself that makes you a better dad, a, you know, a, a better potential partner? Um. I think the problem, I think, well, there, there are two things. One, you, we live in an age of relationship right now. There's a high probability that your relationship's going to break down. Um, and you need to be, you need to think about that. You know, it's why I, I say to any man now, don't get married. Marriage is an absolute fraud. It's a scam. We call it the fraud of the rings. You know, you've got the engagement ring, the wedding ring, and the suffering. I'm the Lord yeah. of the Rings. I, I have three. I, no, honestly, I'm going to I'll share this. Sorry to interject very Good quickly, God. but like my mates, so you'll love that. You'll love this. So, um, unfortunately, I was a bit keen in my 20s. So, like my current wife and my only wife to date, and my amazing wife of five years almost. Of course. Um, Charisse, we before I met her, I've, I've been engaged twice. So, Charisse was my third fiance so all my mates call me lord of the rings lord like you. master frodo because <laughs> i like three rings honestly savage but it's but it's yeah i mean look i mean it's 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 i can't remember what the fucking question was now we've, we've, about we've, developing within yourself something that makes you a oh, yeah. father so 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 i think i think the first you just need to be alive to the risks of, of relationships the risks of marriage you do need to be informed about that because we have a sense like lemmings rushing off a cliff that we're just going to plow on and or we, you know, we, we, but I mean, so I think there's, you've got to be aware of that. I think a lot of men are aware of it now, thanks to what we've done over 20 years. But I think in terms of the role of a father is to love and support your kids. You know, love is unconditional. And if you're seeing your children, don't take it for granted because it can go like that, I'm afraid. Wow. And that is the experience of millions of dads. Next thing you know, they're six foot three. <laughs> Yeah, but not. Uh, but you you could end up in the family courts, and and unfortunately, the underlying yeah. dynamics, the trends are really frightening because it was a third of couples sorted out their separation, a third had disputes, and a third ended up in the family courts. That figures now, I think, forty eight percent end up in the family courts. And nearly half of all couples end up in court. That's not good because there's a presumption of no contact for the dad if you're in court. So it's this is a issue which is getting worse and worse. Um, and getting bigger and bigger, and that's and that's an unstoppable trend, simply because the um, the bureaucratic command structure of the country is basically run by feminists, in my view, and their safeguarding and their anti-male agenda is such uh, that you know this is not going to change anytime soon. I'm afraid, which is why we're working within the system to get better outcomes. But I think in terms of what I do for my children you know, is it's all about love and support. It's all about what can I do? You know, my love is unconditional. I'm a hugger, I'm afraid of. So, so, so I, I hug my kids, you know, uh, always have been, that's just the way I am. Um, you know, not always so keen in it, you know, when they're a bit older. Um, 
or my, or my 15 year old, you know, he's, he's at that awkward age. Whereas my older kids, uh, my oldest one, uh, Daniel, he's 25. He's good. He's a hugger, you know, but we, we're close. We spend a lot of time to get and try to have some quality time, give them some quality time, trying to encourage their interests. Uh, I took my uh, youngest boxing last night. Um, you know, it could be the next Tyson Fury in my mind. You know, he, he's got the fucking attitude and the height. He's six foot three. Got the reach. Um, yeah, yeah, and he's got Think the reach. Yeah, he's fighting. Obviously, I can't tell you how strong he is. He's 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 terrifying. He's it was wow. like trying to play boxing. I said, I'm not playing boxing with you, mate. I'm, <laughs> you don't play boxing. <laughs> yeah, but he's but he's but it's, it's about giving them as much love and support as possible. You know, pay interest in what they're interested in. Um, you know, support them at school, make sure you're you're just engaged as much. It's, it's not easy because everybody's got lives, we've got jobs going on, but quality time every day, so even if it's 10, 15 minutes, you know, is important to focus on the children. They need your love and they need your support and your love has to be unconditional. So I think that's the message I'd, 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 I'd give to you. The lesson at Ireland. Yeah. Lesson at Ireland. I loved hearing your heart pour out as well today because like, I'll be honest, or, and, and I've grown way cleverer and shrewder to it. And now the system works. I've, I've dealt with the media personally, um, small, small percentage, very beautiful people, but the, the system itself is broke. Scam. Those can be horrible. My oh. number got passed around. So when, when you look at Matt O'Connor on, on, on the face of the media, you just basically see, this is the interpretation you get. It's like, you see this crazy, um, sexist, passionate father guy who wants to change the system but like when 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 i see and I, I didn't think that of you i went there's something behind the the why behind this guy's why behind everything <clears throat> and i'm <clears throat> excuse me very grateful to uh to have you on <clears throat> and, and hear your heart pour out like hearing the love that you have for your kids hearing the passion to just support other men i just well, i think it's beautiful mate i'm loving uh, it i've said to far you know yeah i hate journeys I mean, I really despise journalists. There was an interview I did years ago for The Independent, and it started off, Matt O'Connor says, journalists are cunts, some are even complete cunts. <laughs> that's how the interview started off. Um, and, and that's, and I don't think I was, I spoke strongly enough about journalists. Um, but for me, you see, Father's Justice is a love story. It's about my love for my children. That's why I'm here. Um, but when you deal with the media, I was touching this earlier. I don't miss dealing with me. I don't, I don't hanker for the media the way I used to. And this, this Father's Day, so I just want to spend some time. My kids have grown up. That's what I want to do. I don't, I don't want to deal with these people who come down with agendas. Everybody comes with an agenda. Everybody's come to try and do this. I did an interview with the Guardian a few years ago. It's all bitchy, snipey. You know, they're, oh, why are you dressing up? Why are you dressing up? Well, hang on a minute. You, you had Pussy Riot running around a few years ago. You had female, topless females. That's fine. That's great. But when we do our shit, you know, when we did direct action, oh, you know, you ridicule us, you denigrate us, you mock us, you know, for standing up. There's things I've done. People go to me, well, why have you done this? Why have you done that? <laughs> You're shameless. Yeah, I'm shameless because I'm trying to get as much fucking publicity this issue as possible and sometimes i'm afraid the media don't give a shit about me the media don't they they don't care they just because we don't fit the narrative we're not a minority group we don't fit the diversity things it's a white male world um white white yeah white male so-called white male privilege which is a lie that was first perpetrated by emily pankers going back to the first world war when she said men were privileged and yet the men laying down their lives in Northern Europe had fewer rights, the same rights as women. I mean, it was about 4 million of them. Um, but it was this lie that, 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 you know, that women got the vote. Well, yeah, but so did a lot of men, because unless you own property, you didn't have, uh, you didn't have a right to vote. So that lie, the lie of male privilege has to be, has to be nailed. Um, but the media are just, you know, they are, they're, they're just, rancid horrible um and that and i know i'm i'm i'm, I'm generalizing but that's been my experience over 20 years i can only tell you i had people go through my rubbish i had people ringing up 
yeah, ex-partners. I had people, you know, we used to get calls at five o'clock in the evening saying we're doing this. I had the fucking son accuse us of kid threatening to kidnap Tony Blair's son. Complete work of fiction. Complete work of fiction. Ended up on the front cover of the Sun newspaper. Smear campaign against her. Which, to be honest with you, Rory, is a good thing because you know you're getting close to the target when they start mm, yeah. coming after you. But it, it just is my experience of it. I, you know, I think it's better. I'd rather, you know, I had somebody wanted to talk to me this weekend uh, and come down and, and do a piece on Saturday. And I, I, no, I can't be interested. But I did want to speak to you. That's amazing. I, I did I want to speak say. to you because I'd rather speak to somebody who who, who is going to be, we're going to have an honest truthful chat which is uncensored you know and is actually properly discussing the issues and i know that you're not coming with an agenda no no um i'm just rory from nottingham and uh <laughs> we're, we're supporting men and the mental health that's it There's, i wanted to ask you before this is a bit of a rabbit hole question cool. and then we'll try and land it but like why are why are fathers so valuable society and like based on i, I can i can sense from um, the last 10 minutes or so, like me and you are very similar minded, which is kind of cool. But if we weren't, I would love to learn more from you. But mm. like, why is it, why is it a men are so valuable society? And because of that, what, what's, what is the point in this system being so um, unequal and, uh, and oppressing? I don't, I'm trying to work it out myself. Like why, why is this happening? And well, why I is you, I'll, so I'll, I'm going to tell you. Come on, I'm stick it on this. The largest constituency of floating voters are single mothers. Women decide elections, not men. Men are tribal in their voting instinct. So the, so the percentage swings are much greater amongst women. Women make most of the shopping or in terms of purchasing decisions. Um, and so politicians, this is where it starts. You know, people say to me, what sort of politics are you? I come from the Guy Fawkes. School of Politics, the last man to enter Parliament with honest intentions. And politicians are obviously obsessed with one thing, one thing only, which is power. And women decide elections. So that's why they'll go after the Mumsnet voters. They have tea and jamming dodges at Mumsnet towers. Not interested in men because men are tribal in their voting instinct and unlikely to change. Though I think that is a misconception. Um, but that's, that's what's driving it. And then they can't say anything to upset female voters. So if they talk about fathers' rights or equal parenting rights, they don't feel comfortable with it. I, I remember the Archbishop of York, we stormed York Minster years ago, dressed as priests, and long story, um, involving some dodgy outfits. A lot of my life involves a very suspect wardrobe. I suffer from wardrobe dysfunction. You can... Wasn't a stag do, was it? <laughs> No, it wasn't. But yeah, it's yeah, minor like stag, yeah, minor like stag, stag dudes, which are uh, yeah, which are totally out of control, and, and normally involve the free emergency services. Um, it's a proper stag do, uh, but no alcohol. But um, but yeah, but yeah, I remember being to John Santana, and this is this is the cultural thing, and he and he was like, you know, why are you running around dressed up and doing these stunts? I wouldn't have minded from anybody dressed up like an archbishop. It's <laughs> if you. You've been past the mirror lately, mate, right? And giving up stunts. And I said to him, well, what would you say to Jesus Christ? You know, we said, you know, five loaves and two fishes, walking on water, uh, resurrection. I mean, you know, that, that was a man who understood PR. And, um, but it's, it, it's just kind of like, you know, the politicians and the church, they sort of turn around and say, well, we can't say anything, you know, about mothers. And because the conservatives attacked single mothers in the 90s. They sort of back to basics campaigns. So they were perceived to have attacked single mothers. And now everybody feels, well, you know, we came from a patriarchal world and now we're in a matriarchal world. Mm -hmm. And the gender pendulum in 100 years has swung from one extreme to another extreme. That's basically what's happened, in my view. Uh, and that's why nobody, nobody will talk about men's issues. Ian Duncan Smith, the Tory politician, said to me years ago, he said, Matt, nobody's going to talk about this issue because it's political suicide suicide wow. for your political career oh. Talk about men's stuff and it's it's a shame it's a disgrace um that we live in a society so-called progressive democracy where we discriminate against people on the basis of their gender um but that's the reason behind it and right. 
Um, it's a cultural thing. It's a long-term thing. It's something that's happened over the last 30, 40 years, and it's going to be very difficult to turn it around. It's going to be very, very difficult because it requires political action. It needs men to, you know, to speak out, rising up, talk mm -hmm. up, uh, uh, and fight back um, yeah. on, on all these points. Have you um, met Ben Bradley before? No, what? I'm aware of him. Yeah. I'm aware of him. I, I tend to, you know, I'm a bit like, it's a bit like MPs. I'm not particularly keen on most MPs. Um, yeah. You know, um, it's a bit like police officers. I'm a bit allergic to them. I kind of break out in handcuffs. So, <laughs> um, so I kind of like, I kind of MPs, I always, you, I used to do a lot of, well, not schmoozing, but, I, you know, I used to, go in and do bits and, and and I just I just you know I have to check and shake hands and shake how many fingers have I got left afterwards and all this sort of thing and you know um I just found because my experience of MPs has been shocking you know I, I dealt with the Tories I dealt with Labour but yeah we had Cameron you know the snake oil salesman you know he's slippery slimy cunt and he said oh we're going to do this for five yeah we're going to introduce shared parenting and we get elected 2010 and of course you know what Never you know, it, it's not, it, you know what it is. It's all that manifesto where they, they say they're going to do something and they change it, yeah. or they bring in something they never were communicating to the people out of nowhere. Like since when were the Tories interested in green energy in the last 2019 yeah. election? They didn't mention it in the manifesto. I've, yeah. I'm, I'm with you on that. I've, I helped out with the general election um, as a campaign manager in 2019 when they snapped the election. Day, right. And I stood up, I quit my job. To, right. for, for democracy to do with a B yeah. word. I don't want to scare off the viewers and go on the political route, but yeah. I, I, I rose up and, and, and fought um, for what the people had voted for in, in originally. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, well, I agree uh, with that. Well, I mean, I, mean, yeah. I, stayed, I was in the 28th. I, I stood in the 2008 mayoral election. I was up against Boris Johnson. And, um, but in the end, I just didn't, I, I didn't like what, what the, I mean, the party I was with, uh, oh, Joe and, uh, you know, I, I kind of, in the end, I thought if I was going to do politics, I'd have to do it my way. And yeah, I would understand I'm, I'm not a politician, but yeah. if you create a movement and create something that is about people power and getting ordinary people into politics, so not professional politicians, but putting teachers, doctors. Well, that's what we did. Doctors. That's the, the, the party that shall not be named. That's what we did. We had regular yeah. people. We had um, horse farmers, oh, I know. taxi you, drivers. You're talking about the Brexit party. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Now, listen, there was, there was white, black, gay, I know, straight. It was I know, so diverse. I know, I know, um, I know Nigel Farage of old. Yeah. Because he's, he's been a supporter. Where, and I did go. I did go and meet their, um, their campaign manager, whose name escapes me. Uh, and I met some of their candidates. Incredibly impressive. A great opportunity there to have a political party that would take on the Labour Party as much as anyone. What happened with Farage and standing down, I think is one of the worst political decisions in the history of this country because there was an opportunity there to have a second because we have no opposition in this country. No. no opposition. Well, it's red, uh, it's red or blue, and there's a like we've for, for the, the on topic for you know men's mental health for fathers all these things like there's a middle ground party this this country's been screaming out for a, an alternative party that's mm. got people from diverse backgrounds left right straight gay yeah. white black whatever it's irrelevant but yeah like a mixture of crop where you, you've got you know, strength in that diversity and you learn from one another but there's there's a movement there and, and it's just like the system wins and i'm like i yeah, I, I can't disclose what i saw in the general election but yeah. the tories absolutely won that election just because of the way they had the relationship with the media and how they yeah. portrayed things like they did a double spread of the, all the email addresses of the candidates spray party telling the people to tell them to yeah. stand down threatening them yeah just like what how is this like a society that we live in if you look at our political system right it's rigged it's first past the post it should be proportional but that to me is an absolute given um and i would stop people from standing more than one term I don't think you should have a profit from public life. I think you should have 650 people to go in. They earn their 90,000 pounds a year, which would be more than what they earn anyway for anybody else. And they're selected. It's what's called the lot, uh, like lot method, which is the, this is the original Athenian model of democracy where people are selected randomly, like they select juries and you go in and you have a people's parliament. But let's not forget the reason why Labour Party is, the party's over for Labour. I mean, that party is finished. 
yeah. at least for the foreseeable future. And the reason why uh, the Tories did so well in terms of picking up um, Brexit voters um, was because, in a way that Trump did well at one point, was because all the political parties have abandoned men. You know, white van drivers, all the delivery drivers, all the Amazon drivers, all the delivery drivers who are mostly men. And the fucking Labour Party was the party started by men, working men. My namesake was Fergus O'Connor, who's leader of the charges. Right? I was born and raised in the Labour Party. So the Labour Party is totally abandoned its, you know, its core base, its original base. Mm-hmm. Um, and we need an opposition. We need political opposition, but not in a traditional way. We need a movement, which is not about people doing it because they want to be in power. They want to become part. People were doing it. As or, or for a kickoff. Some yeah. people just want to kick off. Or civic duty. You're doing it for civic duty. That's right. right. You're not doing it for self-improvement. You're not doing it for personal gain, like the Camerons and their, you know, horrible, nasty uh, dealing with dictators and stuff around the world or Nick Clegg fucking off the Facebook. Because the problem is, when these people are in power, how are they going to legislate against like social media companies or you know, online businesses like Amazon, if they're thinking about in a few years time, I need a job. So how are you going to apply any form of proper meaningful control and legislation on these businesses when you're thinking about my next job? Because the voters at some point are going to get wise and the voters are going to kick me out. And I think I need to be thinking about my next thing. Oh, I'm only only 90,000 pounds a year here. I can go off and earn half a million, a million pounds working for Amazon or Facebook or wherever it's going to be. So it corrupts the entire system. Sorry, that's my. No, no I'm, I'm not. But, 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 but it ties back go to down the rabbit hole. If you it look does, at the it does. Party, if you could, the Labour Party, go get to the root. Yeah, working men, working men. That's where Labour started. They don't give a shit about working men. Anymore. That's that's where the root is. You know, the, the value in fathers and men. You got you got to. A lot of people don't want to take the time to sift through the crap and and do some research and think for themselves and. and I'm not trying to judge people. That's generally where it's at. And it's like, if we don't get to that roof, we don't expose it and put light on the darkness and say, right, actually what's going on here? Cause we've got plans um, in the future. Like we, we will always support men, but we g- genuinely want to create more media where we're having this conversation yeah. where it's like, no, no, it's not the BBC. I don't have to pay a license and it's not, Oh, I'll just be careful. It's like, no, I, I, I I'm an imperfect person that loves, people and i i want to speak about how i feel and think freely um so we we definitely want to go that route one day but um i say was you we we talk, talk about why why it's like this but there's also another reason you know which is um in the 1980s um uh, i think it was um ronald reagan sort of coined the phrase about feckless um fathers you know and fathers who weren't and it sort of created the idea that you are a cash boy and a sperm bank so you have to pay for children you can't see right so we're a nation now of sperm donors deadbeat dads and that was a phrase that reagan created and then the tories all the politicians picked up and said deadbeat dads not paying their child support fuck you right in my view child support is not about just financial payments child support is about emotional and financial support you cannot separate the two out but it reduces me as a man to the status of cash boy and reduces me as a man to the status of sperm man you know and i'll tell you what i had had a guy here the other day threatening me because i refused to sign the census form I said, mate, when you give me my fucking rights back, I'll sign your damn form, right? But if you don't recognise me as a father-in-law, you can go fuck yourself. And I'm afraid they would take me to court. Get on with it. I mean, I, I love it. I love a day in court. Bring <laughs> it on. Bring it on. I'll be burning. I'll be burning the census form. <laughs> it's my little act of, you know, I've Control. done bigger things, but it's my little bit of civil disobedience. Oh, you know, yeah. and and that's yeah. the problem. Everybody in society, as Howard Zinn said, the problem isn't civil disobedience, it's civil obedience. We're too obedient. We 
we, we, we follow the whole time what we're told to do. Hey, I, think, I think we'll have to do like a part two in the future and talk about the rabbit hole a bit more because I think me and you I think we should do a, a part two with you on a, a lovely landmark surrounded by police and helicopters overhead and we'll get you fixed up in an outfit. I think, I think, I think you're the... You're the future, Rory, uh, and, and, and uh, you know we'll 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 uh, we'll manage your media profile for you, mate. We'll we'll go for it. I'll I'll dress up, mate. I don't mind. I love. Uh, I'll dress up anything. I don't mind anything don't for mind. the cause, mate. Anything. Yeah, I don't, I don't mind doing anything. I, I, I I'm 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 a shameless. People say you know well, you know you know you know you know you know you're 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 a shameless publicist. I said, why wouldn't I be ashamed? That's my job is to try and get as much publicity for a cause that I care about. Absolutely. And I said, and if the media reported things in a normal way, we wouldn't have to do have such to. outlandish things. So right. true. Um, before we close, mate, I wanted to ask you, um, just I like the show's question. So it's like a, a small piece of advice, like for a fellow who just wants to like, just take their life. They, they, like you at, at the bridge almost, you know, where you felt, right, am I going to jump or what do I do? Like, ha- what can you tell them in that moment if they may be watching that right now? Well, if, you're a dad, if you're a dad, you got whatever's happening with you, your children, you're not seeing your children. You've got a duty of care and responsibility to those children. And you don't want to leave, you don't want to, don't want to leave children with the toxic legacy of knowing that their dad committed suicide because that's a really harmful and damaging uh, uh, legacy to leave. And what you want to do is know, know that in many, many cases that the tunnel you are going through will come to an end. There will be light. And if Matt O'Connor can do it, I think you can do it. Because I was a fun, like the fundamentally the worst, most irresponsible person who ended up doing this. But I had the privilege, my eldest boy um, is 25 now, he's working for NASA in California. And I flew over to see him with my youngest just before the pandemic. Uh, and he's in San Jose. We met him there, went to NASA, amazing. And then we did a road trip to Vegas, the three of us in the car. And no camper vans. Death, no camper vans. No camper vans. We we had upgraders, um, but we were going through Death Valley, and I I, I just said to him, I was sitting beside him, he was driving. I said to him, "If you'd said to me 20 years ago that I'd be on a road trip to Vegas with my with my kids, you know, I'd have thought it's just never going to happen. I wasn't even sure I was ever going to see him again. So, wow. if I'd taken my own life, you know, I wouldn't have had the opportunity." And so I, we've got to live in hope, you know, love is the higher law here. And I don't want to sound, you know, fucking new age, you're speaking, but I think I really believe in, you know, you know, love is unconditional. Um, and I think, you know, love, love can win through it. Not always in a tragic case of one Davis, it didn't. But in, in a lot of cases, in the cases where we're trying to make a difference to people's lives, who are, I know, clinging by their fingertips to the edge of humanity, mm. this Siberia of the broken, we're trying to help people as much as we can do. But I think if you just accept and live and say, right, I've just got to try and hang in there, know that a tunnel will come to an end, get the best help and support that you can do. But we need to do more. Yeah, we really, I mean, I, what if I get five minutes, want to set up a um, charitable foundation with counsellors and have counselling services and doing a lot of men's, men's stuff as well. But our focus at the moment is on, is, yeah. on, is, is on the family courts. But there should be, you know, more services out there. Yeah. I'm training yeah. currently. I've got a full-time job. I'm doing this, but I'm doing a level five uni degree in, right. in that. So Brilliant, brilliant. Well, that, I'll, I'll that, launch, that, uh, that's the sort of thing we need but yeah you know if you're going through hell keep going um and 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 remember you know this is about this is about your children uh and you know this will hopefully come to pass and the situation will change and often the kids 
you know, fathers are reunited when the kids become teenagers. The kids will often fall out with the mother or they'll fall out of mother's new boyfriend. I have had cases where the kids have ended up on dad's, dad's doorstep on a Sunday night. They're out, out of the blue. They've, they've not seen the father in two or three years. Things can change like that cool. in an instant. Never give up. You just got to keep going. Keep, keep going. Keep the faith. Keep going. Um, and, you know, as I say, I am blessed and lucky. I, I know I'm fortunate. But, you know, I've got a Father's Day with my children. 20 years ago, I was nearly, you know, I knew you took, took me out of my yeah wow and that's that's a mic drop for father's day this year um so guys just take whatever you can take your time um i'd even advise that you re-watch this because we we went deep which is what we're about in lighting but um there's some absolute nuggets here from matt and we're, we are massively grateful and humbled by wow just this story and um the legacy that he's leaving um to give you fellas um, some sort of hope and help. But Matt, before we go, very quickly, can you yeah. signpost people to any of your service, Father's Justice, like if there's a guy struggling with access for their children, what... what, what... Yeah, you go, we'll just go onto our, our social media. So uh, it's on Twitter, it's at FJ Official, uh, same on Instagram. Uh, and we just, uh, you know, uh, the Father's hyphen for, as number four hyphen justice for all. Uh, yeah. You'll see all the stuff there. I mean, we have an issue with getting support out to people because you know we're incredibly busy and we're booked we've got a backlog because we've got a small team and one of the problems we have is you can't just add people to the team because you need people with experience and and so we we've got limited always limited capacity which is a problem but we are we are doing our best but there's good information on the website there's good advice yeah. provided generally um but the best advice one of the big issues we have is people not following your advice so the best advice of everybody mm best advice is to follow the advice because that's oh, yeah. really really important but dealing with the family courts is, is counterintuitive it's like crossing the mind for them people try and apply normal world rules to the family courts you can't the family courts are really really difficult to navigate um so you know it's 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 tough it is very very tough yeah um but we're doing our best I oh, promise sorry, that. it's quality but yeah guys thank you for joining us for this episode of matt o'connor files for justice Great. Right. it's been sick um Guys, check out our social media coming on the screen as we've had Matt's on there for all the great work they're doing um, at Enlighten the SH1. And if you haven't done, we want to reach as many men as possible, fellas. So um, share this video, like it. And also coming up right now is that red button, press subscribe. Um, we were just like slowly on the grow um, on the world of YouTube. That's got, you know, millions of, of people on there. And we just, want, we just want to reach out. We want to reach into people who just feel like they, they, they want to give up. So um, try and do that for us. <clears throat> but yeah, we'll see you next time. And uh, happy Father's Day. And here's to many more for us fellows. All right. Cheers, guys.